Well, thank you, Alan. Uh, as uh, has been said, uh, bebop is a really hard act to follow, but in some ways what I'm going to talk about relates to what he was talking about, which is cities, uh, and uh, when we talk cities, we look at tall buildings. And of course, uh, for those of us that are in the foundation engineering game, uh, all of those hyperloops have to be supported. And so there's a lot of foundation work that's going to be uh, with us in the future. I want to talk about six issues today. Why do we have tall buildings? What are the foundation challenges? How do we meet those challenges? Um, what are some of the future trends in tall buildings? Are there limits to the height of tall buildings? And what can we do uh, to improve our design processes? Now, in terms of why tall buildings, we need to look at two broad categories of tall buildings. Those that I call functional, which are essentially residential, commercial, hotels, and so on. And the second is iconic, uh, which distinguish a city uh, and perhaps an individual that's got deep pockets. Tall buildings are characteristic of cities, and there's certainly a trend towards increasing size uh, of cities and the increasing uh, proportion of people that live in those cities. When I started my work on tall buildings back in 1990, 43% of the population was in urban areas. Uh, last year, in 2018, that had increased to 53%, and it's projected by 2050 that there will be something like 68% of people that live in urban areas. Now, my remarks relate to both classes of tall buildings, but I guess with more emphasis on the iconic, which I've been fortunate to be involved uh, in uh, in the last few years. So what are the foundation challenges? Well, of course, they weigh a lot. Tall buildings weigh a lot. So there's large vertical loads we have to resist, large lateral loads and moments from wind and seismic. Those loads are cyclic in nature. We need to uh, limit dynamic response uh, of the uh, system uh, because that, of course, relates to human comfort. And in terms of uh, the serviceability uh, of those tall buildings, we need to limit the settlements, differential settlements, and importantly, the tilts, because um, for low-rise buildings, you have a little bit of a differential settlement or a tilt, nobody notices. If you've got a kilometre high building, people notice. So how do we meet these challenges? Well, firstly, we need to use the appropriate foundation system, and that almost invariably involves deep foundations. Uh, piles uh, are the usual solution, but increasingly barrettes, or I think what you call load-bearing elements, are being used. Um, we use pile draft systems in combination because that ca can be economical and we can also use compensated deep foundations. It's critical that we do proper ground characterization uh, and that includes not only finding out what the stratigraphy is but trying to understand the variability of the site because the taller we have the building, the bigger the footprint and the non-uniformity uh, of the ground conditions has to be allowed for. We need to, of course, use the appropriate design and an analysis methods, and importantly, we need to do foundation testing before construction so that we can verify or optimize our foundation design. And then finally, we need to do performance monitoring, and unfortunately, this is done uh, less frequently than desirable, uh, because we really do need feedback uh, on how uh, our design process went. So what are some of the future trends in tall buildings? Well, uh, our taller and taller buildings uh, in urban areas tend to be on more limited sites. And uh, those of you who have been in New York and seen uh, 432 Park Avenue, New York, will recognise that it's an extremely slender building. It has an aspect ratio, the height to, to width, uh, of 15. Uh, normally, we like to keep that down to uh, somewhere around 6 to 8, uh, and even the Burj Khalifa, currently the tallest building in the world, uh, has an aspect ratio of 9. So we're talking about extremely tall, slender buildings. 
and that has problems in relation to the wind loads that um, are generated by such buildings. There are increasing demands of sustainability um, and uh, I think it's interesting to note that every cubic metre of concrete that we can save saves about 0.46 tonnes of CO2 emissions. And every tonne of steel reinforcement that we can save saves 1.7 tonnes of CO2, uh, that of course being related to the, the, the process of uh, making the steel. The other th uh, thing that I think uh, will be forthcoming is the use of deep foundations for energy generation, heating and cooling, energy piles, energy barrettes. These have been mentioned briefly before, and these are, I think, very much a thing of the future. Are there limits to building height? Well, currently we have the Burj Khalifa at 828 metres. Um, uh, the Kingdom Tower is under construction. That will be in excess of 1,000 metres. Uh, this is 3,300 feet plus. And there is also under construction at the moment the Dubai Creek Tower in Dubai, which will also be in excess of 1,000 metres. All of these are in the Middle East. All of these are on large plots of land. So um, there's really that constraint of plot size isn't really there. Now, if we did a simple calculation, if we were on rock and if we had no area limitations and if we had a material of construction that was sufficiently strong, we could actually go to about 30,000 feet, which is the height of Mount Everest. Um, I think that would probably not be realistic. We'd need a foundation width of something like 2,000 to 3,000 feet minimum, and we'd need people that are comfortable uh, at those sort of stratospheric heights. In reality, uh, we have constraints of plot area, slenderness uh, limits, vertical transportation constraints, structural material strength limits, and of course, and importantly, human psychology. Uh, many of us uh, start to become rather uncomfortable when we're a mile or more up. So I would say that um, probably a mile high building uh, in our lifetime is probably as high as we may be able to go. Having said that, I think we can expect and we are seeing increasing numbers of super tall buildings that's in excess of 600 metres or 2,000 feet. Uh, this uh, used to be extraordinary, it is now becoming uh, less so. Finally, can we improve our design procedures? I answer categorically yes, because our aim should be to avoid waste while not compromising safety and performance. Uh, so in other words, economical, sustainable, effective design. This will benefit not only the building owner financially, but also society in general with respect to sustainability. We need to be able to use the best ground characterization methods. Um, and in particular, I think we need to make more use of seismic methods uh, because these are a great way of uh, not only measuring the stiffness of the ground in situ, but also of identifying non-uniform ground conditions. We should use and are using the most up-to-date uh, design and analysis methods and of course three-dimensional finite element analyses which uh, some years ago I argued were, were far too expensive and time consuming are now relatively routine and who knows what will be uh, in the future in terms of easy to use uh, and effective software. And we really need to use the most up-to-date foundation testing the development of the Osterberg cell, for example, has enabled us to put huge loads on foundation elements that we're testing. And in the Dubai Creek Tower project in Dubai, we set last year a new record of 360 meganewtons, which is over 40,000 tonnes, uh, on one of the test barrettes about 70 metres or maybe 250 feet long. Um, and um, that was without actually failing it. So uh, there is, I think, that uh, opportunity now to test to failure huge elements and, and so um, be able to make the most use of the foundation resistance and stiffness we have. 
We should also bear in mind that uh, fiber optic technology uh, used for instrumentation of both of test elements um, and uh, of the foundation itself enables us to get continuous strain readings and, and so uh, that I think uh, is improving uh, our interpretation of the performance of test uh, barrettes and piles. And finally, I think we need to make energy piles a standard part of our foundation design. There's no reason why not. It's not hugely expensive. We're converting what nature has given us, which is a temperature gradient along the pile or barrette, and converting that to energy. It's not a complex process, and it's something that I think should become standard in the next few years. And finally, I think we need to keep in mind that the foundation is just one component um, of many components in a tall building. And we are part of a team uh, in particular, uh, and I think we need to work cooperatively, constructively, and patiently with the structural designer. This is often difficult to do when they come up with 30 or 40 different load combinations and then change them from day to day, but we need to be patient. We need to recognize that we're all fighting the same game and we can achieve in that way an optimum outcome for the owner and for society. Thank you.